Welcome everybody. Thank you. We've now got a recording started. So that's the first housekeeping rule is we are going to be recording this. Um, uh, I'll say a little bit more about that. But first wanted to just welcome you all here today. Um, excited to get this discussion started. Um, when I introduce myself to begin, my name is Emily Goodall and I am the financial system lead with the World Benchmarking Alliance, which is a non-profit for those who don't know, which is based out of Netherlands, but works uh, internationally. So I happen to be based in London. Uh, as you might tell from my accent, uh, certainly encouraging you all as we're introducing ourselves to sort of drop into the chat your comments on um, on who you are, where you're coming from today. Uh, we'll be excited to get the discussion going later after the presentations. Um, but first, uh, a little bit more perhaps about uh, myself. So I joined as the financial system lead, so developing a financial system benchmark, which is going to be benchmarking 400 of the world's most influential financial institutions uh, next year. Uh, we're working on the methodology now and, and in the process of developing that methodology I've uh, got to know the fantastic work of our presenters today so very honoured to be invited in to moderate today's discussion. Um, I'm going to introduce the presenters that we have one by one today but essentially we're going to be looking at the why, the how, the what and the where of system level investing. Um, we have a very knowledgeable audience here today, not just amongst the presenters, but amongst those joining. So thank you for setting aside the time to join in this, which we're hoping, really anticipating to be a series potentially of discussions. This is the very first the inaugural uh, get together. So we're going to um, be actually asking your input and your feedback uh, about this so that we can inform future such discussions. But I think I think it probably leaves me if, if the others are going to be covering the, the why, the hot the how, the what and the where, to be talking to the when. Um, so why this, why now? It feels very much, um, seems a bit of a cliche perhaps these days, but a really, uh, really significant moment in time. Um, it really feels like there's momentum around a number of issues of systemic importance um, that, that's increasingly understood both within uh, society informed by science, it is now informing the private sector, both business, uh, investors, and regulators, not necessarily in that sequence or that order. So issues such as climate change, gender and ethnic diversity that are becoming really forefront of mind. And one of the challenges is that these systemic issues require, um, which actually influence systematic risk if we're thinking in the investor language of today, and they require systemic responses. And so that's what we're really going to be discussing today. There's an increasing acknowledgement of this, but there are many, many questions about how to do this and the practice and what that might mean for financial institutions. So those are the topics that we're going to go in today. Very happy to have you all here to join us for that. And uh, very happy to have the lineup of presenters that we have, who I will be introducing, as I mentioned, one by one. So what can you expect in terms of the logistics of today? We you may have noticed that it opened up, I think, two hours in your calendar when you registered. We're actually going to ask you to stay with us for 90 minutes today. So you can either claim that last half hour back um, or you can continue with us into more sort of happy hour uh, chat and conversation if you're enjoying the discussion. But in that 90 minutes, we're going to have a series of presentations from our four presenters. Um, and then we will move towards uh, questions and answers. So please do, as the conversations go on, as you're listening to the presentations, please do use the chat function actively. Please start posing your questions, things that aren't clear, questions you have about, okay, but, but how or what next? because um, that's the kind of discussion that we'd really love to get to today. We are recording this session, so you saw that it started recording. Um, important to be upfront about that. We will be happy to share that recording with you after the event. Uh, let me take that off the screen, in fact, to record that with you after the event. Um, and we may choose to share some of that as well more widely, so for you to be aware. Um, we're also interested in, if we don't get to answering all the questions that are posed today, then we're happy to follow up on that and perhaps circulate something afterwards. So you can expect that also as a takeaway, depending on where we get to in the questions today. So I think that's our housekeeping for today. Um, unless uh, there are anything else that want to be uh, added in by my, uh, my fellow participants, then I think we move to our first presentation today, which is John Nekomnik and Jim Hawley that we have up. Um, both uh, illustrious history in the investment industry and that has you know, been thinking that's been germinating for many years, which is culminating in their, their book that's just been launched. Um, my partner has just stolen it from me, otherwise it was on my bookshelf next to uh, 
next to Bill and Steve's book, who are then up next on the agenda, I've just noticed, um, which is about uh, the myths of modern portfolio theory and really where we might go from here. So without further ado, I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Emily. Thank you to everyone for being here. Thank my co-presenters. Um, we are all four of us going to try to deal with very serious and big issues um, in about 10 minutes each. So clearly, we are not going to be able to talk about everything. And therefore, on behalf of my fellow presenters and Jim and I, um, I would say I hope this whets your interest and that you read the two books and the two papers that will be referred to. Um, Jim's going to join us for the Q&A. I am going to um, do this portion. Um, our book deals with finance. There, when people say why, there are a number of reasons why. One could be to save the planet. Um, we chose to start with finance because unless we convince the traditional finance community that there is a reason, a, a, a strictly financial reason in effect, to deal with systemic risks in the real world, we're not going to mobilize the amount of money necessary. As you will see at the end, since we are entirely redefining what investing is, how it's done and why, we wind up meeting Bill and Delilah and Mirka somewhere around the circle of logic that reunites finance with the real world. Next slide, please. So, modern portfolio theory as invented by Harry Markowitz was a revolution. Most people think of modern portfolio theory as diversification. Diversification has been around forever. The figure on the left is Tom Quixote. We tracked uh, the phrase, don't put all your eggs in one basket, or diversify, uh, back to Tom Quixote. Um, so, what modern portfolio theory did, though, was creates a very elegant math that enabled you to extract the best possible return per unit of risk in a portfolio. And the math is what was the revolution. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, to make the math work, there were a number of simplifying assumptions that later became codified into theories that wound up totally divorcing modern portfolio theory from the real world. Because the real world is messy and complex and the math doesn't work if you deal with the real world. So the three theories are rationality, that human beings act rationally as investors, random walk theory, that you can't predict the market, that there's no path dependency in the market. And the efficient market hypothesis that information is, depending on your strong or weak version of efficient market hypothesis, instantly or relatively quickly integrated into the marketplace and that people act on it. Now together, those create a perfect myth. It's easy to understand. It's powerfully explanatory. It's intuitive and it's wrong. Next slide, please. We're going to skip over these three slides to show them quickly um, in the interest of time. As I said, we are all trying to get a lot of information. But Daniel Kahneman um, won a Nobel Prize for basically proving that, in fact, investors are not rational. They are loss adverse which means they have path dependency. Next slide. Which means that random walk doesn't work. And in fact, all of you have probably witnessed things like emerging markets contagion, where liquidity drives um, predictable market movements. Next slide. An efficient market hypothesis 
has been criticized for years. And one of the things that has changed since Markowitz in 1952, largely because of modern portfolio theory driving the desire for prepackaged diversification, is the markets have institutionalized. Markowitz assumed that no one was a price maker. In fact, institutional investors are price makers as much as price takers. If, if efficient market hypothesis were correct, there would be no arbitrage, and there'd be no need for inserted trading rules. Um, again, we go into all these in much more depth, but we will go to the next slide. What all these theories do do, though, is they assume away the real world. They assume away the complexities of people being risk adverse as opposed to rational. They assume away the complexities of path dependency, of contagion, of friction in the market, of tax laws, of limited liquidity. They assume away um, how information gets disseminated. And so it allows MPT's math to work, and it works very well, but it is hermetically sealed math, sealed away from the real world. Next, please. What MPT does very well is diversify idiosyncratic risk, the type of risk of company A versus company B. What it also says by divorcing, yourself, by divorcing itself from the real world and only looking at volatility as the measure of risk is that it assumes that you can do nothing about non-diversifiable systematic risk. And non-diversifiable systematic risk is what we would call how markets move it as a whole. Um, and the problem with that is MPT gives you a great tool for idiosyncratic risk, but that's only, depending on what academic study you look at, six to 25% of your portfolio. In effect, MPT says markets affect your investments, but you can't impact the market. And so it focuses people on chasing alpha or active trading and risk mitigation through diversification which is important, but not as important as non-diversifiable systematic risk. Next slide, please. It completes that circle by being self-referential. You'll notice that we always benchmark performance relatively, the S&P 500, the FTSE. That doesn't do anything to deal with the real world purpose of investing, which is to fund real world things whether it is a new company or your retirement. And so if the market is down 10 and a portfolio manager outperforms by 200 basis points, that portfolio manager is a hero. Will likely get a raise, may get featured on CNBC or the FT or the BBC or whatever, but you still only have 92 cents on the dollar in the real world. So we, first, we seal away in the investing world from the real world, and then we measure it self-referentially without reference to the real world. Next slide, please. Of course, all investments do have impact and do affect systematic risk. There are risk on, risk off markets. That's just people investing their index effects. There are super portfolios. Markowitz didn't see it because, as I said, in 1952, 92% of the market was retail. And he was looking at what he could look at, which was the markets that existed then. Next slide, please. Today, we try to affect real world systemic risks, risks of the real world environmental, social, and financial systems, because the real world is where value and risk are created. Other places the value of risk created are, for instance, central bank actions that change pricing in the capital markets, political events. But by and large, real world systemic risks are what creates 
risk in the metastasized into systematic risk in the capital markets. We call this stage three of corporate governance very, very quickly because we go back to 1605 in this chapter. Um, stage one would have been the 1980s where modern corporate governance was born to defend against green mail and other forms of rent seeking. We date stage two from the founding of PRI, which expanded um, looking at corporate governance to environmental and social issues as well, although they had been present before. But today, post financial crisis, we're in stage three. And what that does is people try, investors attempt to mitigate real world systematic issues such as climate change, change in diversity, um, fighting antimicrobial resistance, improving mining safety, so as to understand the feedback loops between those issues and the capital markets. Next slide, please. If there's one slide for this presentation I'd like you to focus on, it's this one. MPT is worth saving, but it's worth remembering that in effect for the last 75 years, the investment community has regarded MPT like Maslow's hammer. It's all we had, so we assumed everything was a deal. It's not. It affects MPT, provides a very good tool to deal with idiosyncratic risk, which as I said, only affects six to 25% of your return. Its technique is diversification. It plays in the capital markets, and its goal is to create the least mean variance portfolio. Stage three corporate governance, this systemic, attempting to mitigate systemic risks in the real world, works on systemic risk in the real world, works in the real economy of real society, and its goal is to improve the overall market risk and return the non-diversifiable systematic risks that we all suffer with. Then you could apply MPT to a higher risk return um, market overall and improve the returns overall. Next slide, please. We know that since we started talking about this five years ago, beta actins campaigns have exploded. They tend to focus, as I said, on the real world causes of risk, climate change, income inequality, racial injustice, or on industries such as pharmaceuticals or animal husbandry with antimicrobial resistance, uh, mining safety for extractive industries, the governance of artificial intelligence for some technology issues. Next slide. And in fact, when we started thinking about writing the book, we were going to um, list all of the campaigns, but we now count over 100. Here is a very partial list of a number of the most prominent campaigns that have multiple investors working on. And with that, um, so I will just sum up by saying that we view all these beta activist campaigns not as political issues. We want to deal with climate change. We want to deal with income inequality, political spending. Yes, there is a political component to it, but they are sequential manifestations of investors attempting to mitigate systemic risk before they can affect the capital markets. And it is time that we recognize this and evolve our investing to deal with non-diversifiable systematic risk as well as the idiosyncratic risk that MPT deals with. And with that, I will turn it back to Emily. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, for that uh, whistle-stop tour through, but very clearly explained tour through the why of today's discussion. So it links very nicely now to lead me to introduce you to Bill Burkhart, who is up next to talk about the how, because this poses some fairly fundamental questions to where next for investors. So Bill, um, as COO and president of the Investment Integration Project, um, thank you for joining us. And I now hand over to you, Bill, to talk through the how. Yeah, 
Thanks, Emily, for being uh, for uh, the setup and for John for giving me such a nice uh, thing to build on. Um, so just uh, jump to the next slide. So just a real quick thing about tips. So we are a consulting services and applied research firm. Um, we provide advice, thought leadership, and a turnkey solution for integrating system level investing into uh, programs, policies, and products. So TIP has been around now uh, basically since 2015 and got together. Uh, founder of TIP is a man named Steve Leidenberg, who's pretty known within the sustainable investment community. Um, when we got together, it was really out of a shared frustration, which I think a lot of people are experiencing now, where there's a lot of progress that's been made, um, particularly on the private market side, where my heritage was in the impact investment world. And for Steve, really on the public market side with ESG integration and just kind of having that question of, you know, are we actually driving real transformational change within the systems that we rely on? Um, we started with that observation in 2015, and we basically spent the last six years or so building the evidence base of who's doing what, um, starting to clar clarify and define some frameworks for investor action, um, as well as generally help investors begin to make this pivot um, towards integrating system level considerations and then working with various industry groups, associations, standard setters to begin to start informing broader industry transformation. Um, I often will say that when Steve and I started out with the system level investment work, um, it wasn't a very crowded intersection of folks that were uh, practicing. So the fact that we're having a webinar with such distinguished folks that have put their own stamp on this kind of thinking um, is super exciting. So um, I'm happy to actually have some people with me on this journey. Um, so I'll just jump into, um, I guess, the next slide. Uh, so this really gets to why we're here and what we're talking about. So this is the book that we just published. Um, this is really the kind of culmination of all the work we've been doing. And it really starts with this basic question of what are the biggest threats uh, investors are facing with their portfolios these days? And you think about it, you can run down the list. John mentioned some of them. So climate change impacts investors across all asset classes. Income inequality threatens to polarize politics, paralyze governments, destabilize democracies, and lead to nationalistic populism. Uh, pandemics disrupt economic models, require heroic efforts by governments and private enterprise to keep system-wide collapse at bay. So these are all these 21st century's fundamentally destabilizing new and different social and environmental challenges. They're global. They have tipping points once passed, cannot be reversed. They're systemic risk in a highly interconnected and complex world. And ultimately, they threaten long-term investment returns across all asset classes in ways that traditional risk management cannot cope with. So that leads to this $200 trillion question that Emily poses, okay, so how are investors supposed to act on these systemic risks? And really what this book does is meant to essentially provide a roadmap for investors um, for how they can shift their investment practices to meet the challenges of these modern times. And it's really based on all this work that we've been doing the past six years. And the big idea at the center of the book and our work generally is that investors need to better understand and act on the big picture context of their investments and the feedback loops between their investments and the planet's overarching systems that make profitable investment opportunities possible. We have TIP have coined this term system level investing to describe this challenge, but like with anything, there's new variations forming every day um, that we're all gonna have to navigate together. Um, so we'll get, jump to the next slide. So, to navigate this kind of bumpy terrain, um, 21st century investing essentially provides the uh, why or the what, why, and how system level investment, what it means to manage system level risks and rewards, why it is imperative to do so now, although I highly recommend John and Jim's book because it does a better job, and how to integrate this new way of thinking into current practice. Um, the six key elements of that process are the same for all investors set goals, decide where to focus, allocate assets, apply investment tools leverage advanced techniques and evaluate results. And for each step of the way, we essentially lay out the need for and benefits of incorporating a system level perspective. And so just as like a, for instance, so with setting goals, if you're a conventional investor, you might create efficient portfolios that maximize returns and therefore benefit society. Now a sustainable investor will add on to that, creating portfolios that also address social and environmental challenges and therefore add this kind of second level of value. A system level investor adds on top of that. So in addition, you're influencing social and environmental systems to generate positive impacts from the outset and therefore benefit all investor returns in the long run. 
And so for each of these steps along the way, we do that contrast where we show as a conventional investor, where do you, what's your starting point if you were just using modern portfolio theory? Then we add in, okay, building on that, a sustainable investor might incorporate these other dimensions and then building on that, here's where the system level perspective comes in. Um, next slide. Now the kind of uh, the meat of this is really around this idea of these tool, 10 tools of intentionality or system level investment techniques. And this was the real big breakthrough of TIPS work where it was to basically say, okay, there's a lot of really interesting work that's happening, whether it's by impact investors, sustainable investors, uh, standard setters, stewardship focused folks, um, universal owners, all of that. But really, what is the difference between a lot of what we consider some portfolio uh, focused techniques versus these more system level ones? And there's 10 that we've identified. Um, but at a high level, what these 10 do is first, investors start working more collectively. And so this gets into this idea of field building and a couple of the tools or techniques are associated with that. Then they change the way they make investments. And this is what we broadly kind of wrap it around and call it investment enhancement. And then the third is that they create investment opportunities that will improve systems. And so that gets into opportunity generation. And the idea is that these techniques, techniques differ from historically used by conventional investors by stressing collaborative actions, building shared knowledge bases, and setting industry standards to create a rising tide of investment opportunities for all investors. And so in doing so, they focus on key leverage points that can strengthen overall systems, enhance their resilience, and their long-term sustainability. And so um, I guess just really quickly, just to kind of maybe unpack a few of them really uh, sh uh, shortly. So something like solutions. And in this particular technique, investors identify investments and promote business models that resolve pressing systemic challenges entirely rather than profit from their continued existence. So it's not just mitigating downside risk, but you really are ultimately, like if you were PGGM and you go out with a solutions portfolio saying, we want to actually solve climate change and what are the big ways that we have to think about it and the kinds of big bets that we need to make. There's other tools such as utility where investors maximize the societal uses for which specific asset classes were explicitly created to address specific systemic challenges. And this gets into this idea that certain asset classes are better for certain purposes. And so if you think of something like public markets equities, those are really good for driving kind of long-term evolutionary change. And we can see that a lot in the kind of movement around diversity, um, racial equity, things of that nature, LGBT rights within big companies. Um, then if you're looking though more for revolutionary, uh, fast change that's really disruptive, then you would stick more to venture capital, private equity, things like that. So kind of thinking about those, and we do a number of illustrations in the book that kind of highlight each of these tools in terms of in practice um, by various investor types. Um, and I guess just to kind of bring it together with an illustration. So if you start to use these tools, um, it, they take different shapes for different issues. And so one of the ones that we often will highlight is an issue like income inequality. So system level investors ask not only how they can manage the risks posed by this systemic issue for this or that portfolio, but what initiatives they can take that will create fundamental change in the system itself that has generated growing income inequality. So they look for leverage points within the current system that will drive change. This means, for example, advocating for a setting of a minimum wage, not just by one firm, but in a locality, state, or nation. The same can be said for other key leverage points, such as diversity, unions and workers, taxes and safety. They want to see that industry standards are set, voluntary if necessary, regulatory if possible, and demand that government enforce the laws and regulations already on the books. They recognize that to make system level change happen, one voice is alone is not enough. System level investors join with their peers to amplify their message on the importance of addressing income inequality and increase their influence. So those making the progress adopt these tactics, um, such as investing in portfolios entirely targeted or heavily weighted towards social and environmental solutions and advocate for pol public policies that reduce systemic risks and advance the health and resilience of crucial systems. They engage at industry levels. They do all these things that we were talking about because that's the way that you ultimately can start to drive long-term transformational change um, within these systems that we all rely on. So I'll just jump to my final slide. So building on all this, and it's part of the reason that we wanted to have this conversation, particularly with the folks that were on this webinar, is that for 
six years, like I said, not a very crowded intersection a few years ago. Um, it's getting increasingly crowded. You see this with the implementation of stewardship codes um, in various countries around the world. You see it with the embrace of net zero commitments. Um, even the CFA Institute, the venerable conservative kind of association, not known for big revolutionary change, has said that the future of sustainable investing is system level thinking. Um, these are huge kind of benchmarks that as an industry, we've all been kind of experimenting um, individually with different ideas. And so this, is, this whole grid here um, really comes from something that we adapted from when the impact investment crowd was coming up. And it was a real great way to kind of illustrate where we are in terms of building the market, uh, the industry for system level investing. And so I think the best way we can describe the last, say, five to 10 years is really this period of uncoordinated innovation. We're doing stuff, Delilah's doing stuff, John, Bill Bowie's doing stuff in Europe, the whole circular economy folks are doing stuff, um, Raj and all of them are at uh, preventable surprises. So there's a number of us that are doing things. Um, it's all great, but now the kind of level of awareness and level of interest has really got to a, this you no know, tipping point where we really do have this opportunity to start um, shifting into real marketplace building and starting to think about how we begin to scale these ideas and drive bigger industry change. And so a lot of the things that TIP has in the pipeline is meant to build on the book um, and really take these ideas further um, and make them as decision useful, as action oriented as possible. And uh, we look forward to coordinating with everybody else that's uh, joined us for this call. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. And I can highly recommend um, the book, 21st Century Investing. I say, I, I told Bill that I sat down to read it, thinking I'd have little bites of it. I have two young kids, so this doesn't happen very often. And I read it through in one go. Um, so it is a very digestible read. So I know that's not an easy thing to do in a book. So well done, Bill and Steve, for that. Thank um, you. But that gives really a sense of sort of how things are starting to come together. I love this final slide for that reason with these ideas that are germinating in different places that are reaching this moment, which is again, why I think an exciting moment for the when. Um, but let me move across to our next speaker uh, to talk a little bit about the what. Um, so this is um, from, based on fantastic research, uh, an ESG 2.0 paper from the Pre-Distribution Initiative and Delilah Rothenberg, who's up next. Uh, and I see several of her co-authors as well on the call. I know that's been a big labor of love um, and, and lots of hard work went into that. So please now share with us, Delilah, the, uh, the highlights. Thanks, Emily, and thanks uh, also, Dimitri, for um, both of your efforts to organize this so seamlessly. And thank you all for being here and to our um, co-panelists. Um, and I'm really excited for you to hear from my co-authors and team members, Raphael Schapp and Amanda Feldman during the Q&A. Um, so we can go to, to the next slide. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Delilah Rothenberg, and uh, I'm a co-founder and the executive director of the Pre-Distribution Initiative. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're really focused on issues at the investment structure and investor levels versus what you typically see in ESG and impact measurement and management, which is you know, the traditional focuses on portfolio company operations. We're looking at issues higher up the capital markets value chain, as we call it, in terms of for example, fund manager executive compensation, is that so high that it's exacerbating wealth inequality? Financial engineering, for instance, in the private equity space or uh, leverage buyout strategies, putting too much leverage on portfolio companies, putting pressure on them to cut costs related to quality jobs or the quality um, and affordability of goods and services. Tax and policy issues, are funds domiciled in tax havens, are fund managers uh, engaging in lobbying and political spend and other political activities that aren't aligned with their stated ESG goals. And then there are issues, if you're looking at these two circles on the far right hand side of the slide, that are really focused not only on uh, fund vehicles and investment managers, but also asset owners and allocators. So, you know, we should all be thinking about uh, what kinds of team incentives and performance evaluations and valuation methodologies and financial analysis will actually get us to where we need to be and to create the right uh, dynamics further down the capital markets value chain in um, portfolio companies. So we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
So as Emily mentioned, this presentation is based on our recent paper, ESG 2.0, Investor Risks Beyond the Enterprise Level. We can put that in the chat for you uh, to, to check out if you haven't already. And um, what this slide does is provide the context. So what we saw uh, going into this pandemic was that non-financial corporate debt as a percent of GDP has exceeded the prior peak and doubled since the global financial crisis. And now um, during COVID with uh, all of the government intervention uh, to prevent a corporate debt crisis, we've actually seen um, non-financial corporate debt increase, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, from the chart on the right, you can see that corporate debt is a multiple of EBITDA, is also um, historical highs with the multiples uh, on average uh, around six times. Um, and, you know, why is this important? Well, the the levels of debt are concerning for a number of reasons. So for instance, in the IMF's October 2019 Global Financial Stability Report, they had a section, uh, and mind you, this was going into the pandemic, high corporate leverage can exacerbate the next economic downturn. That was the title of the section. Uh, similarly, once the pandemic had already started in May 2020, the US Federal Reserve uh, said that business debt levels were high relative to either business assets or GDP, with the riskiest firms accounting for most of the increase in debt in recent years. Against this backdrop, the COVID-19 outbreak poses severe risk to businesses of all sizes and millions of households. So even before anyone could predict that COVID would actually happen, there were concerns about even a slight rise in interest rates or a small economic downturn triggering a potential corporate debt crisis with implications for financial markets and the real economy, meaning socioeconomic implications. We can go to the next slide, please. So who is supplying this debt? Um, interestingly, it's actually the very investors that we um, on this call often interact with who are focused on integrating ESG and investing for impact. So um, since the global financial crisis, the composition of corporate credit has really changed. Uh, one might have thought that it would be banks who are providing the most uh, uh, debt for companies, but actually in the in the global financial crisis and the aftermath of it, a lot of regulation has restricted bank lending and capital markets have stepped in to fill that void. Now, it's great that there are providers of uh, debt financing to companies that need it, but there's been, as you can see from the, from the Federal Reserve quotes and the IMF, uh, implications, there's a lot of concern that this debt is particularly risky. And, you know, the the capital markets are referred to uh, in, in this context in the regulatory space as the non-bank financial institution or non-bank financial intermediary sector. Colloquially, uh, there's a term being used called shadow banking, and that obviously has negative uh, implications. Um, uh, and uh, you know, the financial assets of this sector is, uh, accounts for nearly half of the global financial system as of 2019. And that's up from 42% in 2008, and it's actually grown. So um, we can go to the next slide. So um, what's driving these trends and providing this credit? Well, I mentioned the regulatory changes with the banks and the um, capital markets stepping in, but also institutional investors uh, have had a very difficult time meeting the required rates of return in this low interest rate environment. And so that's meant having to migrate up the risk return spectrum um, for yield uh, and return to, to compensate for, for instance, lower performing traditional fixed income investments. And so, as you can see from this chart on the left, um, private equity assets under management has more than doubled since 2006. This is not just reflective of leverage buyout strategies, but I think it's important to highlight that the LBO leverage buyout strategy that uh, um, uses lots of leverage is the most prevalent form of private equity. And you can see from this uh, survey results on the right hand side of the slide from Bain and Company that limited partners or the investors into private equity are planning to increase their allocations to this asset class. Um, they're also increasing their allocations to other asset classes at the high end of the risk return spectrum, including um, private debt, leveraged loans, CLOs, high yield bonds, and we'll get into that in the following slides. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So. Um, one of the other trends that's going on, uh, and this has been a, a longer trend, interest, the trends that I mentioned on the previous slides about low interest rates um, and you know, it being difficult to meet returns in a low interest rate environment, that's 
uh, been uh, an increasing concern since around the 1980s. The institutionalization of capital and the consolidation of capital flows has been a longer term trend. For instance, in the 1950s, uh, investors were more uh, individual types of investors. I think John mentioned this in his presentation, but now we're seeing a lot of institutional investors in the market. So uh, pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, endowments, and these large institutions have significant amounts of capital to deploy and they need to do it efficiently. Um, and there are a number of other factors that influence how they invest, but they have tended to invest in larger and larger fund managers. And then the large fund managers have significant amounts of capital to invest and they invest in larger and larger companies. So you can see these trends in terms of the fund managers um, specific to the US um, buyout fund market on the left-hand side of the slide and um, the LBO average deal value and deal count. Um, you can see the green circles on the bottom of the right hand side of the slide and see that the average deal size is higher than uh, it's been in since 2005 where this data uh, goes back to. So the negative implications of this um, are numerous. Uh, so just beginning with uh, the fund sizes, and by the way, this is not just in the private equity space, this is in private debt, it's in um, it's in uh, venture capital, it's in a number of asset classes. And what you have here is a situation where um, most of the capital is going to very few large fund managers. It's squeezing out opportunity for diverse fund managers, for emerging fund managers, with fund, manage, for fund managers with more regenerative uh, investment structures and um, fund managers who could potentially get the LPs or the invest the ultimate investors more diversification. Also, when you have so much capital pooling to very few managers in the economy, those few managers become very large. They're charging, you know, 1.5, 2% management fees and 20% carried interest. And that means that the wealth of the executives of those fund managers grows disproportionately relative to other stakeholders, including, you know, their LPs and their LPs constituencies um, to uh, versus workers in the portfolio companies. And when you have wealth that amasses to very few individuals in the economy, those individuals are able to purchase assets, including equities and, for instance, housing, and push up the valuations and increase the barriers to entry for everybody else. And so wealth inequality as a relative measure really matters. In addition, there are lots of concerns about secular stagnation when it comes to wealth inequality because the marginal propensity to spend of the wealthy is not as great as everybody else. Um, and we can get into that in the Q&A if you'd like. Raphael Schapp, our chief economist, uh, has done a lot of thinking around that. Um, in addition, when it comes to the corporate side and uh, corporate consolidation, you have, um, you have uh, situations where very large companies dominate the economy. It's hard for labor to negotiate good wages. That's called monopsony dynamics. Uh, you also have a stifling out of small, medium-sized enterprises, reduced investment in innovation, also issues that Raphael can elaborate on in the Q&A, um, and that the American Economic Liberties Project, I believe Denise Hearn, uh, who's our board chair, is a fellow there. She's also on the call, so maybe we can get into that in the discussion later. Um, one other thing I realized I forgot to mention about the larger fund sizes is that, you know, this is no secret to those of you who are LPs on the call, but I think it's worth mentioning in general is that, um, you know, when, when these large funds are so oversubscribed, the LPs themselves lose um, influence over negotiating terms with these fund managers and they lose uh, uh, opportunity for diversification and we'll see on the next slide that valuations go up when um, there's so much capital chasing the same deals and so it's just not attractive in the long run to be pursuing these strategies whether it's from a, um, a return perspective or an ESG perspective and also when when fund managers gain so much wealth uh, they have the ability to influence um, policy and politics through their own political spending. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, when you have so much capital chasing uh, the same deals and following the same trends, valuations tend to go up. Uh, you can see here average EBITDA purchase price multiples for leveraged buyout transactions in the US are up um, at uh, historical highs. And of course, that's complemented by the tailwinds of low interest rates. When you have such high multiples, it's very difficult for um, for uh, investors to generate returns from new stock acquisitions or um, corporate acquisitions. And it also um, 
increases the wealth of those who already hold um, assets versus, as I alluded to on the previous slide, uh, for those who don't hold assets, these, these high multiples become barriers to entry for them to invest. Again, exacerbating wealth inequality. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So this is just a further illustration of increased leverage in the system. This is a focus on the U.S. leverage buyout market by leverage level, and you can see that nearly 80% of deals are occurring at above six times EBITDA, which is uh, levels that are concerning um, uh, based on historical uh, precedent for regulators and, um, and uh, investors thinking about risk. We can go to the next slide. So investors are, are investing on all different sides of these kinds of deals. They might invest uh, through leveraged private equity strategies, but there's also been uh, a lot of investor interest in supplying the debt, whether that be through high yield bonds, um, even uh, investment grade in the investment grade space, the lowest rung of investment grade. Um, you can see the growth of triple B as in percent of investment grade has increased dramatically recently. So there's been this theory in the private equity space about the discipline of debt, that companies that have a lot of debt perform better uh, financially, they're more efficient, they return more to shareholders, but um, that's also causing a, a deterioration in the um, and the strength of corporate capital structures having implications for other stakeholders shifting risk to other stakeholders and as you can see this is not just an issue in uh, private markets these charts are reflective um, of private and public markets as well we can go to the next slide so um, it's not just high yield bonds uh, and bonds in general that uh, are, are uh, on the debt side. There are also leveraged loans supplied by um, banks or private uh, debt investors packaged into collateralized loan obligations often that are supplying this debt. And this slide also gets into some of the weakening underwriting standards where you can see that the covenant white share is hovering around you know, 70, 80, close to 90% over the past few years and that there um, are uh, increasingly EBITDA addbacks or manipulations to earnings to make, uh, there, there can be a number of reasons for EBITDA addbacks, sometimes justifiable, but often to make earnings look uh, stronger than they actually are. And so there's so much demand for this debt that investors are willing to accept weakening underwriting standards. Again, a, a concerning sign if we have a potential uh, that could trigger a potential corporate debt crisis. Although I know there are various views on the covenant light side, which we could talk about. Okay, we can get into the next slide. Um, what is this debt being used for? Uh, it is often used for, not always, um, but increasingly used for dividend uh, recapitalization, share buybacks, uh, mergers and acquisitions. And not to say that these activities are bad in themselves, but there's been such an increase in these kinds of activities and a lot of um, stakeholder concern that uh, perhaps there's too much going on in this space where you have um, in terms of uh, dividend recapitalizations and share buybacks, money that's being extracted from the company that could go to uh, compensating workers better or being reinvested in the company, and that's being extracted and going to um, shareholders. And in terms of mergers and acquisitions, yes, there are often mergers and acquisitions that make a lot of sense and that are, um, that are beneficial. Uh, to shareholders in the economy and other stakeholders, but sometimes that results in the consolidation that I alluded to on the previous slide. And so the Private Equity Stakeholder Project and American Economic Liberties Project have done some great work on the negative impacts here, which I um, highly recommend checking out. We can go to the next slide. How much risk is sustainable? Well, um, since we were so fragile going into the pandemic, uh, global debt levels have increased dramatically, and this is partially a result of government interventions um, and, uh, you know, bailouts, um, but it's also um, reflective of the high debt in emerging markets as developing countries take advantage of low interest rates, and um, that can be concerning if we do have a rise in interest rates, what's going to happen with them. Um, even at these low interest rate levels, uh, developing countries have a significant amount of debt, just like uh, the corporate debt that I mentioned. And so um, there's concern that that uh, there's money being diverted that should be going to social infrastructure, infrastructure, and um, you know, taking care of citizenry. We can go to the next slide. So why should investors care about all of this? Well, and as, as alluded to at the beginning, um, in a low interest rate environment, it's very difficult for institutional investors to meet the required rates of return. Um, and, uh, and so they migrate up the risk curve for 
yield. Um, however, then you end up with a lot of risky investments. And if there's a crisis, because we have so much risk in the economy, then we have to have government intervention, which requires more low interest rates and more quantitative easing. And as you can see from this chart on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, that a low interest rate environment and quantitative easing means that we're, we're shifting um, to a lower return universe. And that's just not, not good for universal owners or institutional investors in the long run. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see a number of uh, other concerns from other kinds of stakeholders that are mentioned um, that are, that are uh, uh, related. Um, it's also worth mentioning that with all this government intervention, there are concerns about inflation, there's concerns about a weakening US dollar is the reserve currency. What does that mean in terms of uncontrolled interest rate rises in the future, a potential taper tantrum? Um, and uh, uh, financial stability. And then there have been observations that there have been asset class correlations given all of this government intervention that's driving the markets. And um, it's very hard for investors to diversify in this environment. We can go to the next slide. So what are we actually advocating for? Well, maybe the traditional barbell approach is not suitable in the way the markets have evolved. And there are a number of um, additional changes to market structure that we go over in our paper that I didn't have time to mention today. For instance, the shrinking public markets and growing private markets. Um, but what we're thinking about is, are there more regenerative asset classes out there or more regenerative investment structures, perhaps in the middle of the risk return spectrum in the you know, seven to, um, 12 or 13% range that investors could weight more heavily towards. So they're not so dependent on the super high end of the risk return spectrum to compensate for the super low end. And that would uh, get more capital to more diverse um, SMEs and fund managers and um, get more diversification for the investors and build a more regenerative economy. And so that's something that we're exploring and invite you to explore with us. And just on the last slide, um, uh, we can go to the next slide. I should mention, um, you know, some of those investment structures that we're exploring um, are revenue-based financing, equity redemptions, employee ownership, community ownership models. Um, so this, we have a number of solutions we include in our paper, but uh, reconsidering asset allocation is one of them. And then really the solutions that's, that flow from there are about creating an enabling environment for reconsidering asset allocation. So aligning team investment incentives, performance reviews, valuation methodologies, and benchmarking with ESG goals and systematic risk management, um, evolving financial analysis to include include a focus on systematic risk and return. Um, we're very influenced by uh, John and Jim's book, as you can see from that, and uh, develop responsible debt practices. So I'll stop there and looking forward to the conversation. Apologies if I went over, it's really dense content. Thank you, Delilah. It is indeed rich, rich content, um, but I think also doubles down on the on the when point that we raised earlier about why why this, why now. Um, you've given a very comprehensive view there of this the risk to stability of financial markets capital markets from from the trends that have just been accelerated in the light of the pandemic which has far-reaching implications um not least for people um in all of this as you as you explained so clearly i'd love to come back to some of these preliminary solutions for workshopping and maybe get to the discussion but um before i do i would love to turn now to mirtha mirtha castropelli who is the founder of beyond alpha and is going to take us home with the final presentation on the where so I think you're going to start making some of those links, Mehta, to the, to the social side and to you know, what this means for people and planet. Um, Mehta is an economist by background and um, also researcher with State Treat before setting up Beyond Alpha. Also just produced a paper, which I'd highly recommend, uh, but I will hand over to you now, Mehta, to speak to that paper. Oops, thank you. Um, and I just want to start by, you know, by really saying that it's an honor to be uh, part of this conversation and share the virtual stage with, with all of you great thinkers and innovators in the space. So, so very excited to be here. Uh, so we talked about the why, the how, the what. And as Emily said, I'm going to try to answer the where, specifically what's the destination of all of this? Where do we wanna go as an industry? So if you look at the statements from major institutional investors, there is a good agreement that we want to take an active role in solving our world's biggest and more urgent challenges, just as such as climate change and income inequality. You know, we're seeing these big announcements, including the net zero asset owners and asset managers alliances, the BRT and others. 
and they all point to ESG investing as a solution. So I want to start with, with a number, $30 trillion. This is the size of the global sustainable investment market last year, which was a new record high. We've also seen a significant jump in signatures of the UN Principles for Responsible Investing, which now has more than 3,800 members, representing more than $100 trillion in assets under management. But what does this mean for the people and the planet? Are we better off by this rise of responsible investing? And the answer is, not very much, right? And we're now seeing ample of evidence that shows that while ESG investing could help improve the risk adjusted returns of your portfolios, it is not resulting in better people and planet outcomes. In fact, the achievement of the sustainable development goals are now on track to be achieved 62 years behind schedule by 2092. So this realization should be very concerning for all institutional investors particularly those that have expressed a commitment to sustainability and equality. The fact that investors' actions are not resulting in positive change undermines the credibility of the investment community. So we're going to the wrong place and we need to adjust, as they say, you know, the GPS, you know, and we're thinking about our journey. So to do that, we need to fundamentally change the way we as an industry define and approach sustainable investing. And we need to transition from ESG to a system level approach, such as SDG and investing, which I'll talk about today. So we, in our paper, uh, it's a 12 month study um, that we published in January. We define SDG and investing as a system level investment model that takes into consideration both the recent return characteristics of an investment, including ESG factors, as well as the positive and negative impact of that investment in the achievement of the SDGs. And this approach considers not only investing in solutions, but also ensuring that all investment decisions do their best not to undermine the health of our shared social and environmental systems. Very much focusing on the externalities as, as somebody in the chat already brought up. So I'll start with explaining a little bit about why investors' actions are falling short today. So if we think about ESG integration specifically, which is the investment strategy that is seeing the largest growth in the US market, according to the latest survey by the USF, this approach has been very successful in doing what it was designed to do, which was to manage risk. Yet there's no evidence that ESG integration has been able to create meaningful change in companies' practices. And there's a few reasons for this. First, ESG integration, as I said, was designed as a risk management tool, not ESG impact. ESG integration is not intended to actively promote social and environmental outcomes. So any positive impact of these ESG strategies are just side effects. And because of this, it is not surprising that ESG investing lacks any type of impact tracking. So another sustainable investment approach that we studied during our research um, was impact investing which is defined as investments made in companies or organizations with the intent to contribute to measurable positive social and environmental impact alongside financial returns. So while we're very supportive and encouraged by the development in, in this space, we also found some challenges with this approach. First, we saw that uh, investments that are made without the intention to generate a positive impact may fall out of this impact investment universe. And SDG aligned investing, for instance, intends to capture all investments, whether they're impact or not. There's also some challenges with impact investing um, that are more, let's say, operational. First, they are also missing that shared consensus around what impacts needs to be achieved. And there's also differences in how impact investing in, is practiced in the public markets versus the private markets. Um, in the public markets where most capital is invested, impact investing, investing appears to be in kind of the earlier stages of development. And in the case of private markets, where impact investors have been more active, the deals tend to be small and more expensive compared to traditional deals, which makes it more difficult for the in mainstream investment investors to do this type of deals. Having said that, we do see impact investment as an opportunity to provide solutions to address the SDGs and the systemic risk that I know John talked about earlier. Um, so just to kind of clarify that. So if ESG integration and impact investments, investing 
one help us to meaningful contribute to create better people and planet outcomes for some of the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Do we have better options? And we believe the answer is yes. SDGL and investing provides an opportunity to do that. But you may be asking yourself, especially if you have, um, you know, a, a, a fiduciary, let's say, um, how can we justify this shift? Um, so we have identified key three reasons. So if we can go to the next slide. So the SDGs provide a system level framework for investors. They're a proxy for resilience and they provide this much needed, needed, much needed blueprint for people and planet outcomes. So on the first point, the SDGs serve as a robust and comprehensive framework to strengthen these shared social and environmental and social systems that global investors' portfolios rely on. This is systematic risk that John mentioned earlier. And we need to become these system thinkers, as again, Bill pointed out so eloquently earlier, and we need to recognize that these 17 SDGs are interconnected and indivisible. We cannot solve an issue like climate or inequality in a vacuum. And the fact that we continue to see these problems in isolation, it's part of the problem. Now, on the second point, um, an alignment, the alignment with the SDGs is also helpful when looking at uh, or, or analyzing companies' resilience. So in our paper, we talk about uh, this study by George Serafin and my former employer, State Street, after the pandemic. And he found that, in fact, companies that were able, they were actually taking care of their employees in a more active way. They were providing um, uh, flexible work arrangements and paid sick leaves, actually saw better investment inflows and better performance uh, in the next quarter. So it is, again, this proxy for resilience. And lastly, uh, the 17 SDGs and its 169 targets, like I said earlier, provide this blueprint for social and environmental outcomes. And even though these SDGs are not perfect, and I know there's a lot of critics to this framework, the fact that it was agreed by almost 200 countries and it is now being adopted by a lot of people in the civil society and companies can provide this common set of social and environmental performance goals for investors to rally behind. So now that I hopefully convince you uh, that we should consider the SDG as our new destination for the investment process, where does it, this journey begins? So this journey begins with the realization that all investments always have an impact on society and the environment. And we need to be ready as investors to move beyond focusing exclusively on portfolio financial performance and find ways to incorporate the positive and negative impacts or externalities in the decision-making process. So if we go to the next slides, in our paper, uh, we talk about the three C's for SDGL and investing. Conviction, conviction, clarity, and consensus. So we believe that this needs to begin with the conviction that the SDGs are interconnected, indivisible, and that their achievement will result in stronger social and environmental systems that will help us create these long-term opportunities and value and resilient markets for generations to come. So part of this conviction requires that investors not only embrace this financial materiality, but also, and more importantly, expand this definition of materiality uh, towards double materiality, where you consider not only how ESG factors is going to affect the portfolio, but how the portfolio actually affects the world. Um, and I also want to highlight to this end this sense of urgency with SDGL and investing. At the end of the day, investors need to have the conviction, like I said earlier, that SDG creates long-term value rather than having to wait for historical data more and more evidence that you need to care about some of these issues. It, it does require leadership, it does require conviction. We don't have time to waste. Um, so that's the first finding, let's say, of, 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 of the, the first C for SDGL and investing. Now, the second C is clarity. So that's uh, in regards to clarity of definition and clarity of impact. Clarity of definition, it's about having a clear understanding and honest, let's say, honest understanding of what current sustainable investment strategies do and do not do 
regarding the achievement of the SDGs. As I mentioned earlier, while ESG integration provides information about how ESG issues can improve your portfolio and your returns, SDG and investing is looking at how your portfolio impacts the world. So in, in a way, it's kind of the other side of the coin. Um, also, we consider impact investments as a tool for SDG alignment, as long as the impact of the investments is analyzed across all SDGs and the negative impact is internalized through the life of that investment. So that's on the clarity of definition. Again, understanding what is actually going to support impact and what is not. Um, and in regards to clarity of impact, of course, is to, um, you know, it's necessary to, rec to analyze both the positive and negative effects of a portfolio's underlying holdings towards the achievement of the SDGs. And we also are very encouraged by the recent efforts um, to standardize some of these impact metrics. And lastly, the la the, the, we have consensus, the last C. And we need a consensus among investors what's expected from companies regarding SDG alignment. This type of agreement is paramount to amplify the effect that investors can have on companies' activities and consequently on our share systems. A recent paper, one of my favorite papers last year was uh, Professor Rigobon, uh, it's called uh, the MIT called Aggregate Confusion. And he found that one of the reasons that ESG integration does not translate to better companies, people, and planet outcomes is that there's this lack of agreement on which issues matter um, and what uh, companies should be concerning on these issues. So in a way, um, companies are getting mixed signals from investors in what's expected from them in regards to ESG performance or SDG performance or impact performance. So in our paper, I'm going to stop here, but I, I do want to highlight in our paper, we have specific recommendations for asset owners and asset managers in how you can in, uh, implement the three C's of SDG and investing. So just to, um, if we go to the next slide, um, we also put together a, tool, a toolbox or a toolkit where we look um, at the way that investors can create impact which is through allocating capital onto changing companies' behaviors, and then looking at from the two lenses of solutions, which is excellent, but we cannot uh, uh, forget about the do not harm approach. And we uh, you know, highlighted some of the different strategies that investors have available today to align their portfolios to the SDGs. As you can see, I purposely left as ESG integration out of this toolbox because of the, of the comments that I made earlier. So we recognize, as I said, that SDGs are not perfect and they were not designed necessarily for investors. But it's also, and it's also true that investors' actions alone will not be enough to achieve the SDGs in the next decade. However, we believe that the SDGs provide an opportunity to create a common set of goals shared across different stakeholders from investors and corporations to civil society and governments at a global level. The, SB, the SDGs can become the framework in the next nine years for investors to collectively address shared, complex system level challenges and provide a much needed map for investors to focus on outcomes, reduce externalities, and take on an active role in engaging companies to address these or social and environmental challenges. Now, we recognize that this journey will not be easy, but we believe that the change from ESG to system level investing is happening and will only accelerate in the years ahead. It is no longer enough for an institution to hide their head in the sand and say that as long as I beat the, ma the, the market benchmark, my work is done. Instead, and as John pointed out uh, in his presentation, institutional investors increasing influence in the markets also comes with great responsibility. And we believe that these calls for accountability will only increase. So to accomplish this, we need to consider or need to have this strong conviction, a, a greater sense of clarity, and a widespread consensus, as well as an expanded toolbox uh, to influence companies' activities and get to our desired destination. Um, and just to finalize, you know, if institutional investors, and this is maybe an aspirational call to all of you, 
assume, uh, if we assume this critical role in supporting this globally agreed sustainability agenda embodied by the SDGs, we will meet the rising expectations of the moment and generally provide resilient investment opportunities for our clients and beneficiaries for generations to come. So with that, I'll stop here and looking forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Mirtha. I've taken the slides down as well. So as we move to the discussion, I encourage you to now turn on your screens if your Wi-Fi can cope with that. Um, as we move to uh, actually start addressing some of these comments and some of these questions that we've had in the chat. So thank you everybody for listening attentively um, to what is a lot of rich content we recognize. Um, and I actually would like, just while we're reflecting and thinking on what we've heard, Dimitri, can I ask you please to just put a link into the chat? We have a quick survey. Um, I know some people might be dropping off, so I would like you to please um, take a click through to that survey that we put in, because we'd love to get some initial reactions and responses um, to some of the things you've heard today. Um, I'd actually like, in the, in the essence of time, you know, please, please take a moment to look at that. You can open it up, answer it now, answer it later. But there's a question in there that I would really like to um, also get you thinking about as we discuss this now in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, which is around uh, question three, the idea of what you have there for, um, you know, where would you go next from here, essentially? So, and have you previously tried to implement system level investing? Because we're really interested in starting to get more examples from those who are starting to uh, actually address um, and work through some of these quite meaty topics. Um, but while you're taking a look at that, uh, I'd love to start bringing in some of the questions that we've had in the chat. And I will start with our first mover, uh, Mark. Mark, I invite you to come on video, turn off uh, mute and actually pose your question about negative externalities yourself. And if you have anyone in mind specifically um, for that, I know that Bill's already started to answer that in the chat, but um, please do put that to the yeah, any particular presenter you'd like to respond, Mark? Yeah, so uh, thank you. First of all, I'm very impressed with the presentations and I thank all the presenters for their work. Um, uh, investment ultimately uh, must address the measurement of, well, returns. And returns are distorted by externalities. Companies can make very good profits um, by taking a social subsidy, and they do. Um, and, and indeed, there's a, a conflict between uh, companies that are making money because of social subsidies and want to keep them, and um, uh, people who are tired of paying those, those costs. Um, I think that measurement is very important. Um, I think that that's a big challenge. I think data, uh, the data necessary for good measurement is hard to obtain. and, and uh, although I think it is obtainable. Um, I, I think that um, uh, ultimately uh, externalities are, are, are a, a critically important question to deal with um, in, in terms of uh, addressing investor interests and, and um, uh, motivations. Do you have a specific question mark that you'd like to pose on the basis of that um, challenge? Well, I, 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 I pose, I'm sorry, I, pose, I really did pose it as a comment, more than a question, and that's that, the truth of it. Um, uh, when I, I, I know that um, all the presenters are talking about um, what investors can do to um, create a more uh, socially positive outcome uh, through their investments. And uh, the presenters all were concerned about um, uh, the use of, well, frankly, capital uh, uh, and, and better allocations of capital to generate better social outcomes. Um, uh, I think uh, all of this, in some, we, we measure these in, some, in gross terms, you know, all, uh, and those measurements, I think, have to. Uh, in some way incorporate the externalities that are not typically included in uh, our uh, many gross measures. Well, maybe Mark, can I ask Jim to respond to that? Actually, Jim, who's been yeah. uh, John's co-author on the, on the book we started with today. Right, thanks. Um, two, I guess, very quick comments because the issue of externalities is an extended and both 
very clear and also very complex issues simultaneously. Uh, firstly, um, long ago, I and others have developed since uh, the notion of universal owner that uh, some element or some some proportion in a large, highly diversified uh, institutional investors um, are uh, internalized within a portfolio in terms of externalities. So that creates a direct, indeed, I'd argue, and has been argued, a fiduciary obligation to attempt to track and measure those. How one does that, there's, that's a side side important conversation. So that I think is one obvious element. The other element which we talk about in our book, or another element I should say, is that um, that MPT and I think more generally finance, and this has been again widely commented on for years, has uh, become disjoined or unjoined or unhinged from uh, the larger economics or political economy which financial markets are embedded. And so by definition, when you attempt to make those links, one key element of that is, of course, uh, uh, looking at externalities. Uh, there's some really interesting work being done by Seraphim and others on the use of proxy pricing to measure uh, impact and externalities. I, in my own view is this is very much the direction to go in. I think there are different elements to that that uh, Seraphim and his colleagues have not developed, but I think this is a really important direction to go in. Um, and depending on the kind of externalities we're talking about, I don't necessarily agree that they are difficult to measure. Some indeed are, others I think are extremely measurable. Uh, in, in a very quantitative way, and indeed have been, and there's a long history uh, in, in economics of, uh, of attempting to do that. So th that would be quick response, but I agree with you. I think externalities are critical here. Thank you, Jim. I'd like to actually group two questions now, if I may, unless anyone else would like to quickly come in from the presenters on the externalities discussion, otherwise, no, I don't see any hands up, I'll move forward. I'd like to group two questions together, actually. One that came from Julian. Uh, Julian, uh, feel free to come off um, and, 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 and pose the question, but I'd like to combine, it's about the combination, I think, of where we go next. So the phasing and you know how to accelerate the phase, particularly with the challenge that's also posed here by Chavi, thank you Chavi, about the risk of sort of first mover disadvantage potentially um, on investors who proceed in this way. And I think that's both important questions for the phasing, but Julian. Can you come off mute, Julian? <laughs> Always the problem was getting off mute. <laughs> I'm there. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, I think we see here the same problem we see with the impact investing market or generally the impact measurement uh, discussion that we see is the same for the system level approach. Um, how can we, uh, besides having you now a business approach for system level investing, how can we um, push for stronger competition and find the most efficient vehicle um, solving problems on a system level yeah, and from my perspective that is especially um, via benchmarking via i don't know verification of management approaches or performance measurement let's say bloomberg data yeah and, and have you thought about how you're gonna, gonna assess it if if you want to actually push for competition of different players and so on i was wondering if, if i didn't read the book yet <laughs> so uh, yeah yeah, so, so um, just to jump in, so this has been something that we, as we think about the kind of step change needed as we shift from different phases of industry development, um, one of the things that we readily acknowledge is that the, the right hand doesn't necessarily know what the left hand is doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so every one of us is kind of doing something really interesting that I think speaks to some level of altitude or some dimension of this. Um, and you can see it kind of reflected across the industry. So. You know, PRI has been focusing on the promotion of a financial, a sustainable financial system. Uh, the GIN has the big 10-year roadmap for uh, systems change and impact investing. Um, CFA is calling about, you know, our systems thinking, how do we integrate it? And then you just see this di diversity of practice right now across all these different um, segments of the industry. And it's unclear yet, do we truly have the right policy enabling environment? What do we actually want from policymakers so that they create an enabling environment but don't stifle innovation? Um, do we have the right data that makes all of this decision useful? Um, all of those things, and then kind of getting a sense of, okay, where is everybody on their progression? And so one of the things that 
so TIP hasn't formally launched yet. We're going to do it next month, but we're putting, we're essentially about to launch an industry needs assessment. And we're going to be tapping all the people on this uh, webinar on the shoulder for help here. But we're going to be fielding a survey. We're going to be doing a bunch of focus groups and targeted interviews. Um, this is in partnership with Humanity United and UBS Optimist Foundation. And the idea being that we really, we did this big report in December where we say essentially laid out a roadmap for industry transformation around consideration of systemic societal issues. There were some really great recommendations. And the follow-up question that most people got, we got was, okay, but what happens next? Not in like a what at a broad sweeping level needs to happen, but like in a detailed, what are the milestones, what are the benchmarks, what can we all be doing? Um, and to do that, we need to get a better sense of where everybody is in that progression. And so this needs assessment project is going to essentially talk to everybody, um, hoping to, you know, we're gonna to talk to the folks doing reimagining capitalism at Amidiar. We're gonna to try to connect that with the net zero folks. And we're gonna to try to connect it with TCF, you know, really try to understand and get our hands around the full scope of this opportunity. And the idea is that we'll publish this thing, uh, it'll be at the beginning of next year, and really be this public good that can start to drive more comprehensive, clear, and effective action across the industry. So it's going to get to the benchmarks. It's going to get to um, really understanding if we're actually moving the needle or if this is just more window dressing. I mean, the thing that we want to avoid is that this becomes another version of greenwashing, where people just kind of slap something on there, just to get credit, but they're not actually really driving the change that we want to see. So um, yeah, so the, the short answer is we don't have the answer yet, but we will have the answer, hopefully in about six to nine months. And Charlie, can I ask you to step in actually with your comment about this issue of in that moving forward and in those examples, um, the, the disadvantage potentially. Can you, can you be done? I'm thinking maybe Mirtha or, or Delilah might want to pick that up, but Charvi, do you want to come on? Um, I Honestly, I don't really have more to say than what I put there. Like, it's just something that I've been thinking about. Like, the conversations I've had with asset managers, it always starts with, yes, we need more data. And then when we point to data that exists, it's like, yeah, we don't really believe it. So I think one thought that I do have is, I think I agree with what Mirtha said, which is, uh, I think some of it is to do with conviction. And the other thing that hasn't come up explicitly in conversation is that I feel like similar to everything that we're trying to achieve, like systems change takes time. So the impact that we're, the positive impacts that we talk about is is a, f a few years away, if not decades away, it's definitely a few years out. And so any advantage that we want, that we see investors are gonna see is also potentially years out. Any disadvantage is immediate. Uh, is that even a good way to think about it? Uh, have I had too many, uh, skeptical conversations and so i don't see light at the end of the tunnel i'm yeah just curious how the group is thinking about how are we going to move forward is one investor going to say i believe in this and i'm going to take a big stand uh, an immediate stand i see a lot of statements uh, those statements are also five years out seven years out uh, so yeah like how, how how is this going to move forward Meta, see you yes, primary. yes, yes, yes. And I, I think this is such a great point. And so for, for our paper and the reason that we got to conviction is, I mean, I did interviews. We interviewed over 40 institutional investors for a research, right? And that idea that even if you show them all the data in the world, they may not believe it, right? Um, and uh, particularly around impact, there's so many it's such a qualitative assessment. It's so, it's such kind of a messy process. And I really commend George Serafin and his work on the impact weighted accounts, which is all good and great. And I, you know, I really wish, wish, you know, wish him best and wish the whole team best. I just think that right now, like even if you put it there, they may not see it. So it does require that conviction and, and for an asset owner to say, this is who we are. We believe that we need to you know, eliminate child labor in our supply chain. Do you really need evidence of materiality to make that statement? Do you really need, you know, so that's the piece where it's like, what are some of the, 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 the minimum standards, the, the social norms that you wanna implement without the need for evidence of materiality? We don't have time uh, to put all these data. The data may not be available. They're always gonna find holes in the data. So that's my impression. And so just as a, a little note, the people that I interview were traditional investors, right? So we're talking, I mean, we're not talking people in our bubble, we're talking to traditional investors and, and the way that they're looking at that. And just one point to Julian's, um, because I'm, I'm actually working on an SDG analysis uh, 
uh, uh, project. And again, it's a very messy project. It's qualitative. It, it is going to require a lot of sources. What we found in our research is that a lot of these SDG alignment products that are out there are all revenue based. So just looking at products, not necessarily looking at the supply chain, not looking at lobbying activities, all these other pieces that are absolutely critical. So it is incomplete, just looking at revenue. There's a lot of SDG cherry picking. We're saying, okay, I can do SDG six and I can do SDG that, and then I'm aligned. They're not looking at it in an interconnected way. Um, and again, there's a lot of company disclosures, which we know has a lot of gaps. So um, happy to, again, talk on the side of some of this, uh, this project on SDG alignment um, analysis. Thanks, Meta. I'm gonna to turn to John. Um, to answer this and then I'll come back to you, Julian. But Delilah, I want to prime you for the, uh, the I think the trillion dollar question that Johannes has pay, posed in the chat. So just to get you thinking about that, but first to John. Yeah, I want to be optimistic here and remind people that the best is the enemy of better. The reality is this is happening. We said we're all big activists now. We can all point to efforts by large asset owners and asset managers around things like gender diversity, climate change, as I said, antimicrobial resistance, mining, deforestation, biodiversity. The list is really long. The coalitions have lots of assets of the management. I will, in fact, pick on everyone's favorite um, villain just because they're largest here, BlackRock, and say, you may not think BlackRock is doing enough, but BlackRock, by coming out as they did, private sector standard set to get TCFD and SASB more recognition and reporting than others. They have put tremendous pressure on governments around the world to change standards. Um, and I'm not paid by BlackRock. In fact, my view of BlackRock right now is if I were a teacher, they would be the student I'd say to look at to see how fast the industry can move. Because as the world's largest investor, they have to get a lot of internal and external constituencies on board, deal with a lot of regulations in a lot of the world. And my answer to the industry is if they can go as far as they have gone, you can do at least that because you have less complex issues to deal with. And so what Jim and I found in writing the book is there's sort of a Stockholm syndrome going on. People have been trained for so long to say they can't do this, that even when they're doing it, they say they can't. We had Alliance, Alliance Global say, you can't do this. Two months before announcing they were stopping funding and insurance of coal plants and decarbonizing their portfolio. And now, of course, they're one of the people, who, one of the firms that is leading the, the net zero initiative for um, investment firms. And so I am going to be more optimistic and tell you that, no, it's not all going to move evenly. It's not going to move the pace. It may not move as fast as you want it to be. My friend Bill Bowery would say, and it doesn't deal with planetary limits and it, but all the motion is in the right direction and practice is leading theory. And what you are seeing, this, this call would not have been possible three years ago. The number of people on the call would not be possible three years ago. Things are moving in the right direction. And so I don't want to not challenge the, but it's not enough mantra. Yes, it may not be enough, but damn, it's a lot better than it was here. Thanks, John, for that note of optimism. Um, I'm aware there are the 90 minutes, so if people need to drop off, feel free. We will be sharing the slides and the recording after the fact, but for those who can stay on, please do. Julian, I'll come back to you, but I want to first make the opportunity to answer this question that Johannes poses, which I think is linked to what John was just answering, in my view, which is, how do we move from here? Yes, there are movements and there can be optimism in what we see, the inertia at the same time is also great. These operating norms run very, very deep, um, as has just been commented by Monique as well. Um, so how do we, to take out Johannes' question, and, and feel free to come on mic if you would like, Johannes. Um, so many are still getting their heads around ESG. If we look at the sort of across the, the financial industry, 
how to get this conversation other than like nice discussion like today amongst um amongst the professionals at the scale that is really needed for system change delilah do you want to take that sure thanks johannes for that great question um you know one of the things that i think we need to keep in mind when we're talking about system level investing is who the ultimate investor is and when it comes to venture capital investors they're not actually the ultimate investor they're similar to a portfolio company in some ways um not every way but uh the ultimate investor are really the lps into the vc firm and so the lps need to ask themselves as you know presumably diversified investors do they want to be exposed to the systematic risks that are really externalities that might emanate from the VC's practices? So it's it's incumbent upon the LPs and the institutional invest the, the asset owners and allocators who are investing into you know these funds and companies to make the point that um, yeah they care about um, ESG because it addresses idiosyncratic risks to the companies or or um funds financial performance but they also really care about systematic risk and the externalities that that fund strategy or company strategy might um, create that cause uh negative real impacts to the real economy and uh create financial market risk and that's uh you know speaking to john and jim's point that they raise in their book that most of these investors returns are influenced by systematic factors, not by idiosyncratic factors. So um, uh, I, I do think that in there are some cases and there are some types of ESG interventions that generate stronger returns, particularly, uh, you know, I think VC investors and PE investors have been drawn to resource efficiency and um, certain, certain more later stage climate tech opportunities um as uh as they've, they've they found that attractive but there are other esg interventions that will not generate the returns uh that, that will not generate returns in the short term uh, but they will maintain the the integrity and the quality of the overall financial system in the longer term for longer term financial um uh, fin for longer term diversified investors. I mean, the other thing that I just wanna uh, highlight while I'm talking about the point of returns is that um, when I mentioned investors could potentially allocate more to the middle of the risk return spectrum, uh, that also is not to suggest that they take lower returns overall. That was to suggest that they allocate less to super high risk investments and less to super low risk investments and put more in the middle of the risk return spectrum in a you know roughly seven to, um, 13% range so that they could meet the required seven-ish uh, uh, percent rate of return. And those, there are certain types of investment opportunities in the middle of the risk return spectrum that are considered more regenerative, uh, provided that they're uh, conducted a, a structured a certain way that allow investors to more stably meet their required rates of return. So they're not as volatile as some of the uh, higher risk investments. And so it could be a particularly attractive option for institutional investors. Um, so I, I hope that's help. I guess one other, one other quick thing is that, um, and this is not, this is not something that's easy to accept, but we have a financial system that's been built on decades of cheaper, free human and natural capital. And so our benchmarks are inflated because we've been undervaluing those costs. So maybe we need to rethink what our financial benchmarks actually should be. And then we can talk about whether ESG outperforms or not moving forward, if we've readjusted the historical benchmarks to account for the true cost of human and natural capital. Thank you, Delilah. And Johannes, I'm sorry that I skipped over before you had a chance to unmute yourself. So please come in if you want to elucidate uh, on your question or, or follow up on Delilah's response. Yeah, fo follow up, all oh, good. I, I didn't need to... Um reiterate my question. The, um, you're absolutely right about what you're saying. The ultimate players in this game, I think, Delilah, are the LPs, but they're exactly on the same line of, we don't want you to even do ESG to the VCs. And I think there's two or three interesting things going on here from the observations, the research I've been doing with both parties, the GPs and the LPs, perhaps just to share uh, um, one or two of those. 
One is allocations of LPs in, in VCs over the last decade has gone up dramatically. We're talking three, four times. So somebody like Princeton Endowment has um, quadrupled their VC allocation. Why? Because low interest rate returns, don't let them make money elsewhere. So for them, the VCs are one of the only ways of how they can make money. And they will do anything but tell them to do anything differently, right? So they're explicitly, and I'm, I don't want to call out anyone, the LPs um, are explicitly saying, we are never going to say to Andreessen, to Sequoia, to whatever you name it, Union Square, to change anything. Because we are dependent on them, in particular in the US, because if you have a power law distribution of returns, unlike in buyout and private equity more generally, when it comes to the um, VCs, there's very, very, very strong players. The top 10% of these VC funds in terms of financial performance will not be changed. And that combined with this, prop for now, until there's something fundamentally different happening here. Um, and and the, combined with another thing, this creates a massive issue, namely that all the other funds are just copying, to a certain extent, what these funds are doing. Right? So there's, there's a massive um, structural problem that, we are, that are imp implicating uh, the LPs, particularly in the American system, where everyone says, we can't really change anything. And the, the, the GPs are sitting in the middle and funds like Andreessen are just keeping, keep on raising insane amount of capital um, living off their, um, as you were talking about, right, their um, management fees quite well. So for them, there's no incentive to do anything differently, which is slightly different in Europe, very interestingly, because the LPs there, First of all, we don't have the same power law distribution where very, very few funds control the whole market and everyone follows them a little bit, but not quite. And the LPs are much more independent because the biggest LP in the European ecosystem is the European Investment Fund, which is all managing, quote unquote, our money. So it's all European state money, ultimately, a lot of it taxes. And they have a very different mandate that isn't all about financial returns. So that's why in the VC ecosystem, we're really just talking about that, the ESG agenda is being pushed much, much more here, possibly despite us not knowing exactly whether this is going to lead to the same or even outsized returns. So I'm, I'm quite hopeful to follow John's comment here when it comes to Europe for one leading something in this venture world, which might be ESG slash even systems level investing. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. Sorry, Delilah, do you want to come back on that? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I think, um, Johannes, that's, those are the very points that we try to emphasize in our paper about the inertia at the LP level. And so um, it's really important to uh, help educate LPs on how these asset allocation practices are contributing to negative impacts that can boomerang back to their portfolios and their financial returns in the long run. Um, but I also think it's it's illustrative of the fact that we need better ways to measure and manage systematic risk because um, LPs just don't know how to incorporate this into their asset allocation um, and investment strategies. So I would really welcome actually in the survey link that Dimitri posted before and encourage you to post again, um, is to respond as you reflect on those challenges about the inertia point about the practical actions of of moving forward but I'm also struck in this conversation so far so I'm going to take moderator privilege um, while seeing whether other presenters want to come in on the, the debate just raised around we've talked almost exclusively here about European and US perspectives uh, we're talking about systemic challenges that uh, and, and I'd like to move that to Juan's question therefore um, about the importance of extending that discussion the power bases that we have of the global financial centers are very much dominated by the global north and I include East Asia in that um, but they are not necessarily representative of course of the needs of people and planet more globally which I think is what Mirtha was speaking to but Juan brings in the really important point if you would want to come in Juan about the importance of place-based and localized considerations to this um, and wondered whether any of the presenters would like to respond about how they've incorporated that into the thinking so far. If I don't get a volunteer, I might pick on someone. Bill, there we go. Yeah, yeah. so so I think what this whole conversation and, and this comment in particular, I think it speaks to this idea that when we talk about taking a system level investment perspective, it's not just about asset allocation. Because exactly the inertia around LPs or kind of the, the needed reforms around policy and regulatory environment, these are all things that, uh, and, and even just having access to the right kind of data so that people have clarity about what they should be considering and what they shouldn't. Um, these aren't asset allocation decisions. These speak to this broader set of 
tactics and strategies that investors now need to deploy if they're going to truly drive systemic change. And this was something that, I mean, in the early days when John and I were, and Steve were working on a lot of this stuff, um, the initial research with TIP, when we started to actually look across and we looked, we surveyed investors both in the US and the UK, around the world in Japan and Australia. And, and we really tried to take like a comprehensive scope of what are the different ways that people are really driving this change. So you take an issue like a local perspective, that's huge, that's really valuable. And it's something that, you know, trying to make investments and CDPQ has done this. And there's others that we've highlighted in the US and around the world that have done that, where they really try to look at all of the different dimensions of what's causing stress in a local system. And they start to make investments that essentially boost the resiliency and the interconnection in that, in that essentially local system. Um, this this is, has shades of this idea of additionality, which is another system level investment technique. We're really trying to figure out how you avoid redundancies and you build skills gaps and address things like access and whatnot, where you're creating more durable systems. But there's all these other things, particularly around polity, where you're trying to inform the creation of a, a policy environment or kind of rethinking how you evaluate. Somebody may have commented here about it's not necessarily impact measurement, but it's assessment. We, we use the word evaluation that comes out of the work of a number of folks, um, Michael Van Patten and others that have been doing really interesting stuff around that. Um, so it, it, we often get this question about like, what's the perfect system level investment? It doesn't exist. It, that's one piece of a larger uh, toolkit that we need to all harness if we're going to move this. So, so it's a really good question, but it's you can't look at it just from that particular lens. You kind of have to take a wider angle. Emily, if it's okay if I jump into that as well, because I have kind of a different perspective. So I mentioned these SDG assessments, and I love that comment uh, on that. Um, so. And for instance, when we're looking at the SDG assessments by country, we're studying actually in emerging markets, um, we're focusing on Mexico, Colombia, and Peru. And we're looking at this SDG assessment, not in isolation. Uh, well, we have general SDGs, then we're gonna have industry SDG, you know, by industry, and then we're gonna have by country because each country has a different, they have their own unique challenges. So in Mexico, for instance, we're finding uh, that you know, gender equality is a particularly very difficult issue uh, or, or, or a concern. And then you're looking at Colombia and then they have issues on, on inequality, on, on like income. So to be able to personalize by country, or not personalize, but, but adopt these assessments to the unique characteristics of that country, I think is critical and something that we're already considering. Another point, and this is, I think, to Mark, to your point, and Mark, I really enjoy your comments. Um, it's we're focusing on, on, on the North, right? On, on the US and Europe. We're actually engaging with asset owners. And again, with my investment hat, we, we call it asset owners. So asset owners in these economies. So we're talking to pension funds in Mexico, in Peru, in Colombia, saying they are universal owners. They, are, they're in, they have an interest that these economies are strong for, you know, in the long term. So what better pool of capital and pool of assets for them to invest in their own economies with a systematic risk in, in mind when they're making some of these decisions? So I do think there's power to also engage local asset owners um, to have them think more about systematic issues when they're making their investment decisions and engagement decisions as well. Thank you, Meta. Um, and does anyone else like to come in on that? I wanted to come, to, and, and if Juan wanted to respond, then feel free to come in or keep an eye. Um, but Ayubani, I wanted to move to your great question from uh, Lagos in Nigeria, prompted by this uh, discussion. So I think your question was to learn if there are other systemic risks that come to mind when referenced um, beyond the risk of VC preferences for companies to be registered outside the country that you raised. I wondered if um, we had any takers, maybe Delilah, I don't know if you want to speak back to that, given your um, your focus is quite a lot on alternatives. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, and uh, I'm glad that we're, we're bringing it into the verbal discussion because it's complex and hard to address in the chat. Um, absolutely. One of the issues that we're focused on at the pre-distribution initiative is the domiciling of funds and tax havens. Um, but, you know, I've done a lot of work in sub-Saharan Africa um, throughout my career. Most of my time in private capital markets was actually focused on the continent. And 
I was actually drawn to private equity and venture capital because I thought it was a great way to attract capital to underserved areas of the world like sub-Saharan Africa. And um, I, I found myself in an in industry where, um, you know, you could say, oh, we're creating jobs on the ground or we're building infrastructure that's going to support SMEs and create uh, jobs uh, a, a degree further out. But um, so much wealth is taken um, out of the country in these investments. And it goes back to the point that I made earlier about um, our financial system is built on decades of cheap or free human or natural capital. And that includes uh, the, the ramifications of what happened during colonialism and certain elements of neocolonialism that we have now. There's so much wealth in developed countries because of the historical dynamics. And then that wealth can be invested into developing countries and most of the return is, is taken out. And one of the reasons why labor is so affordable and land and resources are so affordable in these developing countries is because of uh, dynamics related to colonialism um, and uh, they're just undervalued. And so um, I think we really need to, I don't have a good answer, unfortunately, but I think that we need to spend more time and make more space for having these kinds of really important conversations about how do we, um, how do we repair that um, discrepancy and, um, and injustice and um, these dynamics that really perpetuate today in our system. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's what I have so far. And I, I would be happy to make, uh, you know, to commit more time. I'd love to commit more time. I mean, that's the whole concept of pre-distribution. Um, it doesn't, in my background, it looks like redistribution, but it's actually pre-distribution because I don't know, I couldn't figure out how to set up this background before this call. But um, we really need to spend more time thinking about those kinds of issues. And, and I'd be interested in doing that. And at risk of widening out the conversation even more wide, well, widely, widely, um, the, com this, the conversation that's going on in the sidebar chat about, you know, are we talking about capital markets here, which is dominated to your point, uh, Mark, by Europe and US to some extent, or are we talking about wider investment structures that need to change? I think it's definitely the latter to Yangbo's response. Um, that, of course, widens the pool of those that we're trying to talk to and engage around this topic, which widens the challenge. But it feels like that is part of the of the challenge if you're going to have systemic change to really broaden that out. So I wondered if anyone actually from the participants or the pre present presenters wanted to share any ideas or examples from um, outside of capital markets and what we're discussing uh, and alternatives, um, you know, thinking about the role of banks, of insurers as well to expand that more widely, or is that too big uh, for, for today with 10 minutes left? While you're thinking of that, I see Juan, your hand is up. Please do come in now. Yeah, just very quickly. I mean, at least for, for the lens of where we work at Equal Agriculture Partners, we focus a lot on biodiversity and conservation impacts. So a big part of this place-based approach is basically that you can't reach those in decades or centuries if you're just investing sparsely all over the world, a bit here and a bit there. Um, if you're not actually localizing synergistic investments you know across a specific landscape you're never going to reach these impacts and we're not going to reach the sdgs because things are interconnected if water runs out it doesn't matter how much you've been able to advance on the other fronts because no one's going to stay in that territory anymore water's no longer there um and and at the end i think that that's that's kind of the key thing is that when we're looking at investment from a systems level perspective it has to be based in territories and it has to be locally adaptable because if not you can just invest in asset class for the asset owner you're diversified great for you but you're not really going to fix any of the problems that are happening on the ground because all of these are interconnected you know most of our biodiversity hotspots are placed you know where most commodities come out and since we're not you know accounting for natural capital um they're undervalued like delilah said and there's no way to actually understand the real value of of these investments and the extractive kind of potential they have you know when soy gets exported from brazil it's not just the deforestation that's happening they're exporting most of their water abroad as well so it's one of these key issues that you know if you're not accounting for those impacts and you're not taking a territorial approach there's no way for you to know kind of the 
externalities that are going on and and there are kind of place-based initiatives of you know local development plans even regional development plans that are very clear in their priorities and you know in the kinds of investments they're looking for um, i just think that there's a huge disconnect between that and how even the systems level level approach is taking to just think about national policy broadly and not focus on local policy because in the end national policy won't get us anywhere I mean, if you're not looking at sub-national initiatives, jurisdictional approaches, um, that never trickles down, especially in, in emerging markets. So, sorry for going no, on. No, thank you for that explanation um, and for the work that you're doing. Jim, I said, do you want to come in there? Yes, yeah, very quickly. I think I, I, I entirely agree with that and the number of comments that have been made. I think there's a loop here to one of the issues that got raised earlier, and certainly John and I talk about it in the book, uh, but at too high a level, I think this is a, a next project, not just for us, that in terms of incentives and in terms of benchmarking, whether that's for individual um, asset managers or whether it's for funds, either active or passive or other kinds, uh, and in the public and the private markets, is that we have to work into a system of benchmarking that pulls in the kinds of things that Juan was talking about and others have so that you have a combination of the purely relative benchmarking now, which is, uh, a, at the end of the day, is a self-defeating uh, a, a cycle into a series of relevant uh, absolute, that is to say impact, uh, in the sense, that knowing that all, all impacts, positive, negative, neutral, uh, have are, are real, that begins then to join financial market operations across the board into how the real economy actually works and what it really does at the end of the day. And so it really means rethinking and reworking the whole benchmarking system, I think. Uh, it's funny you should say that, Jim. Uh, as, as you know, I work for the World Benchmarking Alliance, and Jim, you're a valued member of our expert review committee. So. Um, Actually, we're, you know, once we're, we're putting out our draft methodology for the financial right. system benchmark, coming from a different perspective, Jim, it's not the sort of standard financial benchmark, but it's taking the, that systems level approach and taking Merthyr's comments about linking it to the SDGs and what is our North Star really in all of this, because if we don't agree that North Star, then uh, really where, where will we end up? Um, so we'd be very delighted to invite comments in on that and we can follow up with that after this. But Yangbo, you have a final comment I think I can give you or question maybe for the audience. Yep, uh, definitely. So uh, quite a lot in the uh, chat I posted there. Mm. But uh, something that I'm finding is probably the most underrated is the amount of uh, real assets that are currently um, available. So even that if you consider Things about the overall amount of uh, wealth in the world, all the national assets, four hundred four hundred plus trillion USD. About three quarters of that are somewhat in the form of uh, real assets in one way or another, and at least an amount equivalent to once or double that of global GDP is actually publicly owned or managed by various levels of government. It's that not many are properly monitoring that or even knowing what is the highest best use value of all of this so if you've um, read some of the writings you know, public wealth nations public wealth cities by Dag better a former finance minister from sweden also i met for poor on public sector balance sheet and such uh, you should get a pretty good um, overview of that but there's something I like everyone to uh, keep in mind in terms of uh, place-based potential Thank you for that comment, Nengbo, and we're widening that out indeed to incorporate the role of states and governments in a way that isn't around policy making, but as I said, so thank you for that comment. I think we're nearly at time, so I wanted to really thank our presenters today and for the, the participants for such fantastic questions and active discussion, both in the sidebar chat and in this, this discussion. You've probably noticed on the initial slide I posted, and you'll see it on social media, this is the first of two. Webinar, so we're going to be repeating this. So it's the same content. So I wouldn't imagine you might want to listen again unless you want to uh, follow and miss all the bits. Um, we will be recording, of course, this. You know, recording will circulate that along with the slides. But if you think there are others that would value from being part of the discussion, we absolutely encourage you to uh, promote that second event, which is happening on the 29th of June at a light, later time zone. 
to accommodate perhaps some Asian participants early morning for them. Um, I don't know if we can add the chat in there, Dimitri, as well to the second um, to that second webinar. And also really encourage you to complete the survey. As I mentioned, this is the first of what is hopefully a series. And we really value your feedback and, and perspectives on what you've taken away from today. Um, also any suggestions about where we might go next and how we can best help you in furthering this work. Uh, really very interested to hear your perspective. So thank you in advance for um, completing that. Um, and I think, I think we covered most of the questions, so apologies if we haven't. If we haven't, then uh, I will be pulled up on that and we can always circulate that along with the slides and the recording after the event. Um, but I think that just leads me to say uh, thank you very much once again for joining for today um, and for the discussion. I've learned a lot and hope uh, it's also been instructive for you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thanks to everyone. Thanks. Right. Take care. Bye. Take care.